All right, excellent. And there you go, it's all yours. Okay, let's see. So you can see my presentation, is that correct? But it's not on presentation mode. Is that better? Okay, great. All right, well, thanks so much for inviting me to talk today. Um, I am, my name is Julia Nordyke. I work with U, uh, the University of Wisconsin Sea Grant Institute. I'm based up in Green Bay. Uh, we are a NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and uh, University Partnership. So it's a national network and there's sea grants connected with our nation's coastline and their universities in all coastal states and Guam and Puerto Rico too. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm an outreach specialist. I am kind of like uh, the extension specialist for the Great Lakes. Uh, you have, um, you do have an ex, uh, another Sea Grant outreach specialist in, located in Milwaukee. Her name's Deidre Peroff, and she's at the UW Milwaukee School of Freshwater Sciences. So, um, and I'm sure she's been working on a lot of these issues too. Uh, so thanks so much to Nan for inviting me. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about codes and ordinances and uh, how they're barriers to green infrastructure today, too. And I was really excited to see uh, Dave's projects because we're trying to do that work up here. And it's pretty amazing to see your large scale projects being implemented. So um, anyway, OK, back to green infrastructure and codes and ordinances. So um, why actually are codes and ordinances important for green infrastructure in general? Uh, well, you, as many of you know, because you're probably with a lot of the municipalities, um, their um, codes and ordinances really govern a lot of, oh, I'm so sorry. I for, almost forget this every time. I'm just going to go back and I have to give credit uh, to my colleagues, Julie Beth Hines with Birchline Planning and Kate Morgan uh, with the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District. And this project just in general, and then also even this presentation would not have been possible without them. So um I'm sorry to backtrack there, but okay. Um, so codes and municipal codes and ordinances uh, govern a lot of aspects of community life, as many of you know, such as community services, the standards and for land use and development, you know, road widths, uh, public health and safety. They also set forth the procedures and structure for governance in your communities. Um, so many of our communities around the country, uh, we have very outdated local regulations, and they have a really big impact on green infrastructure. You know, codes and ordinances were developed a lot of the times at times when we didn't really understand the impact of water resources, our water on our, our water, or stormwater on our water resources. So we've, they've found examples through this project of, you know, where to tie up your horse properly downtown, or or even like different parking ratios for men's and women's department stores. So uh, there's a lot of outdated codes and ordinances out there. Um, and even the absence of language about green infrastructure can really deter its use in your community. Um, also, there's a lot of other emerging and evolving needs and issues that ultimately involve local codes and ordinances. For example, like it seems like there's a never ending uh, um, revolving door for your stormwater permit updates. Um, we have, we're starting to see these really intense storm events in our communities and how are, how is our infrastructure going to be designed to stand up to withstand those in, in a more, in a better way, in a more resilient way for our communities. Um, some of you um, might already have the TMDLs, others might be work, like they just haven't actually done the calculations yet. So a lot of the work in codes and ordinances can actually help communities move towards meeting their permits, whether it's the stormwater or their TMDL permits too, to get credit. Um, we also have uh, a lot of changing technical standards. Uh, so this is an example of uh, bioretention out on the West Coast, and it is a total fail. So what the worst thing we could do in our communities is really have these failed experiences because then no one's going to want to do them again. So having up-to-date codes and or, or up-to-date technical standards is really important for these projects to be successful in your community. Also, uh, if you're familiar with green infrastructure at all, it's uh, over the last 20 years, like the amount of technology and the different types and the different ways you can manage stormwater are just constantly evolving. And um, there's things new coming things on online. And some of them don't really work that well. So one of the things we need to be aware of is that our codes allow to have flexible 
um, and, and at the same time have standards for how they're supposed to perform. But we don't want to limit our codes and ordinance, our communities to only certain products or certain types of technology uh, when we're constantly learning about how these things work. And then finally, there's the discretion and decider barriers. So we often know that when codes are out of date or ambiguous or the code language is absent or conflicting on a green infrastructure practice, uh, that local staff and administrators, whether through culture, experience, or just their own preference, preferences might uh, affect how the code is actually interpreted. And in the end, that's going to have a really big impact on whether the community, the developer, uh, is even willing to use or in, and use green infrastructure in their projects. Um, so some of these things that happen in communities that are not quite in the code, uh, those charismatic leaders. So I know that you must have some of mine. Most of the ones I know are these mayors who are gung-ho. They're like, green my city. Uh, so, but what happens when they maybe, I don't know, get hit by the beer truck or don't get reelected and all that great work that whatever department has been leading the efforts in your community, um, it, uh, it just goes away when someone potentially leaves or changes course. So it's really important to think about how we can codify those amazing stormwater and water resource protection and um, uh, efforts in our communities so that they can, you know, live out in a legacy. Um, there's also the discretionary approval needed, the barriers for discretionary approval. So when the applicant shall incorporate the comments of the village engineer or the fire chief or the department, and really being on the other end of not uh, being on that project when, it, when that project fails and getting uh, maybe the public responding to that. Um, so that can definitely be a barrier too in communities. Uh, and then aesthetic habits. Um, I'm guessing this is potentially happening in some of your communities, whether it's berms or stormwater ponds, uh, landscaping in general can be a big one. Uh, really uh, mowed grass in the right of way and avoiding complaints. So really the kiss of death to green infrastructure and new approaches uh, is when uh, because we've always done it this way is actually backed up in the code. Uh, so we really, again, want to open up our code so we can be more flexible and allow some of these new, new approaches to be, to be able to be implemented. And then there's the situations when potentially no one's deciding. So uh, the council might say, we let the applicant decide what they want to do. Uh, so does anyone see in this picture what is missing potentially? And it's hard for me to, I don't think normally someone would shout it out, but um, it's, I don't think anyone can put it in the chat from me seeing it. But really, uh, if anyone notices, it's the parking bumpers that are missing. And so your community goes through this effort to put in this beautiful new bioretention, bioswale, uh, and then someone just drives right into it. Um, so these, again, are what will lead to potentially bad designs, can lead to failed experiences and with the community and and, and have a potential impact for the future. So we wanna make sure that our communities are, when you're implementing them, they're really being uh, referring to available relevant technical standards again. Uh, and then probably one of the biggest barriers of all that we hear um, everywhere is, you know, the, the, I heard it failed in, you know, in Duluth or, or Superior, Wisconsin, you know, we have, to our soils are made of clay or it, it, the freeze thaw cycle doesn't work for us or it's too cold or it's too flat. Um, and so these can really have an impact on whether uh, communities are even willing to try things out uh, in, in general. And in this case, demonstration projects might be a really good option for communities. So Really, the main point is that if the code language is not clear that green infrastructure is an acceptable or preferred approach to managing stormwater, it's really just not going to be considered uh, in development proposals and, or capital projects and design plans. Uh, so it's just not going to be at the table as an option in general. And we, we definitely see that as we see development move forward in our communities. Uh, and the thing is, it's not about more cost or regulation. Uh, really, at uh, this site, um, you know, with the many communities have maybe potentially screening co uh, ordinances, um, but we know, and 
this hedge is a very common one of a way to do that screening, but we know water doesn't run uphill. So how can we better uh, take advantage of the kind of standards that we have so that uh, it's better for stormwater and the receiving body of water um, with a lot different results. You know, parking lot landscaping was required at both of these sites, it was paid for, uh, and how can we actually leverage um, more opportunities to, to uh, manage stormwater and get better water quality. So you might be thinking, well, we comply with the state stormwater standards, that's no big deal. Uh, well, here's a, a really good result. This stick in the mud was approved and built in full compliance with local regulations and the stormwater permit on the site. Now, does this look, I, any arborist or any of your urban tree foresters are just like cringing at this. Um, and, uh, you know, first of all, like someone paid for this to be planted and put in the ground and then it's, it's basically wasted money and dead. Um, so how can we really take a look at what we can do better uh, to make sure that, again, we're leveraging our resources as they go in? Um, so as part of this project, we really also understood that um, do codes actually matter and like they're pretty ambiguous. Uh, it's really hard to kind of wrap your mind around this. Do codes really make a difference in water quality and stormwater management or does it not really matter that much? So as part of this project, to help communities really understand uh, the impact that codes can have on water quantity and quality, uh, we did uh, example projects where we looked at uh, the landscaping, the standard, uh, and first of all, so if you're some, if you're a planner in the audience, you're just like loving this slide. Uh, but we know that most of this is just going over everyone's head, and everyone's like, "Oh my gosh, like what is this like code? All this code language." Uh, but this particular one is a markup of an example of how we can actually uh, include bioretention into our landscaping standards uh, for redevelopment projects and new development. Um, so what we did to try to help visualize code changes and their impact on the landscape for municipalities is we took that code change and then modeled in, um, uh, oh, I want to say swim, but it's not swim, it is wind slam, wind slam. So our state, uh, Wisconsin state stormwater modeling programs that many of our municipalities use, uh, we modeled those code changes on the landscape with our whether this site was like redeveloped or developed in the future. So for this particular one, uh, we looked at whether this parking lot redevelopment, which is just less than a half an acre, if we just added, uh, based on that code change, uh, 2,300 square feet of bioretention, what would the impact be to water quality and quantity? And you can see it's pretty dramatic just from this one type of green infrastructure implemented at this site. Um, another type of green infrastructure we can think about is just replacing turf grass with uh, long rooted and native vegetation. Uh, and, and so this is an example of a, a code ordinance that would in, uh, really encourage the use of replacing turf grass at a site. Uh, and this is a pretty incredible site. This is 1.74 acres and just the substitution of the turf grass alone without any other uh, green infrastructure practices like bioretention or anything, uh, you're going to reduce uh, almost 75%, three quarters of your volume of runoff uh, and 64% of your total suspended solids. So if you, um, we actually had to take out the other types of green infrastructure because it was at 100% runoff uh, uh, capture uh, before. So uh, that is a pretty incredible result. Um, and then the last thing that codes and ordinances can really impact is the amount of impervious surfaces. So let's try to prevent the amount of runoff in the first place. So this is um, thinking about like your parking and your just types of impervious surfaces. So updating them to current national standards for parking ratios um, and, and reducing that impervious surface in your community. So this is a small commercial bank. Uh, as you can see, it has six lanes, drive-through lanes. That's probably not that necessary. So uh, what that updated code would really do is uh, this is, uh, uh, again, we would re uh, reduce the area by two drive-through lanes, um, update parking ratios, and then also, which would get, um, which would remove uh, 20 
parking spots in general, and then also increase uh, buyer retention at the site. And we can see that it can really make a difference just by reducing that impervious surface on a site through code. So yes, the answer to that question is yes, codes do matter and we can, we can do better. So implementing simple code changes can really make a difference in our volume and TSS loading. Um, if, and many little things can improve just water quality outcomes in our communities. So um, as part of this project, so what we did is in 2017, we developed this workbook. It's the local code and ordinance audit. Uh, it's really targeted at county and municipal staff, particularly those with roles in zoning and land use. Um, also, uh, your elected officials and then organizations like the Root Pike Win, uh, who might their missions are to actually help reduce, improve water quality and reduce stormwater runoff. Um, so, what this workbook does is actually really gets at, and it's online and the download fillable PDF too. Uh, and then I also have some hard copies I would normally hand out, but if you really want a hard copy, I can definitely send one to you in the mail. Um, and it's really about looking at codes and ordinances really comprehensively in your community and figuring out where those barriers are in your codes and ordinances to help you implement it more in the future. Uh, just a brief background on this, how this came about. This was actually um, a project based from uh, Kate Morgan. Uh, at the time, she was with 1,000 Friends of Wisconsin and in partnership with MMSD. Uh, they did code audits um, for all the municipalities within their service area. Uh, and so what we understood is that this was a really amazing tool to help communities reduce those barriers. So we, we made it into this workbook um, uh, to try to expand it into other communities could actually tackle this. So what makes this audit unique in general compared to other tools like this that you might've seen? Well, first of all, we really, really take a no judgment approach that's community, like your municipality oriented. Um, we understand that communities' goals and values vary very differently from each other. <clears throat> and one of these things does is this audit tool really brings different departments together and really helps break down those silos and just get the conversation started amongst all the people that need to be at the table for when you're talking about green infrastructure, because it's really not just stormwater infrastructure that we're talking about. We're talking about neighborhood revitalization, environmental justice. We're talking about water quality and habitat and biodiversity goals and just general community improvement. And there needs to be a lot of people at the table. And, and we understand that communities are really unique. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> also, one of the things that's really interesting about this audit is it's not, there's no model ordinance for green infrastructure. Um, as many of you know, codes and ordinances are really complex and they vary greatly between communities. So there's not going to be one size fits all for all communities. So this audit tool really looks at the different nuances and the differences between uh, the ordinances and where there's barriers and not just one blanket ordinance in general. And then also one of the big, most important parts of the audit process in general is that you know, your communities really have their own needs and goals and the culture. So really understanding how green infrastructure fits into the context of that culture is really central to making this process a success and be able to promote the use of green infrastructure. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so as part of the code audit process, we developed a community scoping exercise that kind of gets people to the table and talking about how does green infrastructure look in your community? And, and where are the barriers, like the people barriers and like what, what, what kind of green infrastructure might your community be interested in? Have you tried green infrastructure before? You know, are there people that has, have you, has it been successful in the past? So this community audit process looks at exactly like, what are your natural assets in the community? Do you have things that people celebrate and really rally around in terms of your water resources? Those would be areas to think about. Uh, what kind of hazards do you have in your community? How do you have nuisance flooding issues? Do you have uh, gray infrastructure that you maybe need to take stress off of? Like where are those opportunities for green infrastructure to help those? Mm -hmm. Uh, what is your current uh, community identity and character? You know, there's a lot of green type organizations, 
Um, you know, master gardeners or even community gardens are an amazing place uh, to start even uh, demonstrating green infrastructure with your community. They're natural allies. So where are those allies in the community? So when you go to make code changes or work on these projects, you have people that are gonna come out and support, support of them. Uh, have you tried green infrastructure before? Are you using it already? Uh, and if so, has it was it successful? Has it failed? Are there lessons learned? Uh, things that that might help your community move forward. Or again, if you haven't started working with green infrastructure in your community yet, maybe thinking about a demonstration project to demonstrate not just to the community, like the residents, but even just to staff in general, uh, that these kind of types of projects can be successful if imp implemented and placed properly. Uh, and then also just general community acceptance. Do you have parts of your community that might be open to um, integrating new types of practices for stormwater and green initiatives? Or do you have maybe uh, uh, also neighborhoods that are, are more, that have more consistent looks to them and there might be other things that you might be working with them rather than doing uh, specifically like rain gardens or something like that. So really understanding kind of like how your community might accept these types of practices. Um, and then uh, the code audit is really, really down in the weeds. Um, so it's, it's um, and it takes into account the nuances and it's very comprehensive. So uh, we understand that codes and ordinances. So for a certain green infrastructure practice, we talk about a nuanced code ranking. Uh, it's not really, when you start to ask these questions about your codes and ordinances, there's typically not gonna be like a yes or a no. For example, like if we take permeable materials, uh, you could have, so we do have the ranges, you know, the, the bright red on the right hand side is like the practice is totally prohibited on the green, it's completely allowed, but there's nuances, maybe a code's in conflict, or maybe it's just not mentioned at all, which again is going to be a barrier. So taking permeable pavement, for example, maybe your community allows it in general, but there's some part of your code that actually requires it to be seal coded, kind of defeating the purpose of, of uh, permeable materials in general. So that's what our code audit really tries to look at is where, where those nuances are preventing things from happening. This is kind of an example of what uh, the nuanced ranking looked like um, before. So each of those columns, uh, one through nine is a different community. And again, taking permeable materials, all those were code audit questions. Uh, and you can really see that, you know, in community seven, they're ready to go. They, there's not, not gonna be a problem if you wanna do a green alley, for example. But community number five, they've got a lot of work to do. And uh, if anything wants to get done in that community regarding like a, uh, integrating a permeable parking strip or, or a uh, parking lot or anything like that. Uh, the code audit covers 15 different code topics. Again, really comprehensive. So um, everything from, you know, uh, architectural design standards, stormwater ordinance, of course, landscaping standards are a really important one, site plan review, um, pretty much everything that uh, where green infrastructure could be occurring uh, in there. Some of the big themes that the codes cover in general and that are really trying to get at in terms of water quantity and quality um, one of them is reducing impervious surfaces and maximizing that uh, vegetated landscape. So some of the barriers might be in dimensional standards or building codes in general, uh, but the really the goal um, is to, you know, again, here is a not happy tree. Um, so how do we get to looking like something more like this? Um, and really, like when we go to a parking lot in the middle of the summer, where does everyone park anyway? You know, it's under that tree. So how can we uh, really maximize our, our space. Another um, general code topic is uh, reducing effective impervious surface. How can we stop like direct runoff going into our creeks and waterways? So we know that this kind of turf grass is not doing much for water quality. You know, it's, it's the roots are like this thick and you have to maintain it with a mower. Uh, oftentimes it needs to, it's applied with herbicide. Uh, and so there's a lot of, a lot of um, things that we need to think about when we're thinking about areas where there's direct runoff going into creeks. Why, why couldn't we create something more like this to really um, uh, protect our waterways a little bit more? 
Um, and then also restoring and protecting the natural functions of soils and vegetation in general. Uh, so this is, um, uh, was a stormwater outlet at Bradford Beach in Milwaukee. So about 20 years ago, you know, this beach was completely contaminated. It had many stormwater outfalls just going straight to the beach. Uh, and it was basically abandoned. No one ever used it. Um, but today they put in six rain gardens that intercepted the stormwater uh, that used to contaminate the beach um, and, um, uh, and to catch all that discharge. And really using that as like the natural soil conditions to buffer the beach. And now it's one of the most popular beaches in the region. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of great, great activity going on there that's completely restored in terms of economic, economic and social benefits. Uh, one thing that communities really should be thinking about is what we like to talk about is controlling pollution from yucky things. So, uh, for example, you know, where are things that shouldn't be draining to directly to your, your creeks or in your rivers or just straight to the storm drain? So thinking about like doggy daycares or oil change, places where you get your oil changed and car mechanic stuff. Um, so in this particular case, and dumpsters are a great one. So this particular dumpster site was solely responsible for contaminating a beach downstream. And it took them a while. It was behind a big box store. They didn't ever think that that was going to be the case, but they finally discovered it. And so, you know, when they're not contained, uh, you have birds and animals uh, doing their thing and spreading bacteria. And so how can we actually control the, the conditional uses on our sites that really do need a little bit more thought when it comes to stormwater management so it's not going directly into our water resources? Um, and then one of the most important really overarching themes of our code audit is uh, that in, to clarify the intent and purpose in, in your, in your um, uh, purpose statement, sorry, to, in your purpose statements, your comp plans and things like that. So this is an opportunity to explicitly state that the protection of water resources and green infrastructure is really important part of your community vision and important. So basically when the developer shows up or anybody shows up to do something, they know that from the start, that's their starting place. Um, and so this is really a really amazing opportunity to really get that out front. Uh, so that's, that's how um, we can uh, use, you know, guide permitting and, and site planning in general. Um, so what we did is in the code audit, uh, we, what we did is we couldn't, we basically changed it to an A through F system because we couldn't hand out colored pencils with every everybody, every book. Um, so, uh, but the brain child behind this uh, methodology for the code audit itself is Julie Beth Hines with Birchline Planning. Uh, she helped develop the nuanced code ranking. Um, and so what one of the questions looked like, for example, in the code audit is, so you say you're in the landscaping part of it, and you can look and you see the audit question is pretty specific. Is the use of deep rooted plants encouraged in landscaping standards? Um, it kind of talks about the type of barriers and where you might find it. And then the community as a whole or your consultant would give you a grade on that. And then that would be kind of a starting point. Uh, the online fillable PDF document then has, we have a report card at the back. Um, so you, you could actually compare more quickly uh, different sections of the code audit. So uh, this is the agricultural design section and like the fillable PDF, I think auto populates from when you're, you're typing into the document. But this is a good way at the end to really start to compare those different parts of your code. So what's likely gonna happen if you do one of these is there's gonna be a lot of different areas that you could or your community could improve. So where do you go from there? Um, obviously starting with the low scores is a logical place, but uh, as there might be many, you might want to think about other criteria that might help you and your community prioritize uh, the next phase of implementation of, or changes to your codes and code amendments. So one of the ways we're going to bring back that scoping exercise, really identify where in your community um, and how, you know, what were, where, again, where, where are there opportunities to make code amendments? like what we just went through, how does it fit within our community is something that you can refer to. You also need to start thinking about like, how does green infrastructure in general, general meet your community goals 
overall. So do you have current and future development happening or, or do you, are you a completely built out city already or community already? In that case, you might wanna think about, you know, um, shared parking or um, agricultural design facades and what you can do on the side of buildings and, and things like that. Um, but maybe your community still has a lot of room for growth. Um, and in that case, you might wanna start thinking about like subdivision regulations, uh, cul-de-sac widths, sidewalk widths, uh, things like that. Uh, maybe your community doesn't have any really new near term um, or new development happening or redevelopment happening. In that case, you might wanna think about residential green infrastructure and how that fits into this. So this is a Montessori school uh, in Milwaukee. Um, in, a, in a community in, in the Milwaukee area, I should say. Uh, and before, this is actually what you're looking at is a transformation of what used to be like all pavement play, playground uh, to a complete uh, giant stormwater rain garden, outdoor educational experience, basically. So the kids can use this as um, recreational space for, uh, for recess, but it's also like an outdoor laboratory uh, that they can really use in general. So then by that time, <coughs> hopefully staff and, and what's happened through that process is you have some really good recommendations going forward about code amendments and code changes that code amendments that you think that would help benefit and reduce those barriers. And then of course it goes to your, maybe your village board or your city hall, um, but, and where, as I'm sure many of are familiar with, that's where the most interesting stuff happens. But what we've really built into this process is that they they already know about what's happening. They've come along for the ride. You've really focused in on green infrastructure that again fits within your community, uh, and that and then and it just it has to move through the process really with staff and it's and and with the council, so they're not surprised by anything. So um, these things have taken. I've seen them take a while, but in in general, if you're working in concert with everybody at the table along the way no one's surprised and no one and everyone has kind of had their chance to voice what their concerns are and build in uh, the right codes code amendments for your community but this one is always kind of a wild card right uh, so that's all I had today um, uh, I'm happy to take questions now or later after Bree's done and again, you can go to our website and download the code audit. You can contact me if your community is interested in doing one. Um, they're very, I've found, I've worked um, all over the, well, I've worked definitely in the Great Lakes on these and in Wisconsin. And I've, you know, been working with people in other states too. And uh, they're very fundable projects and they don't, they don't cost too much. So uh, there's a lot of people interested in funding policy work like this. So uh, if anyone has any questions related to that, I'd be happy to answer that too. So uh, with that, I will say thank you. And um, I will hand over hosting privileges. Um, actually, if you hold on for just a, sec a second, Julia, I'm going to sure. reclaim being the host here for a second. I just wanted sure. to um, uh, add a couple of things. You had mentioned mayors and other decision makers in various and sundry kinds of municipalities. One of the reasons that I was so keen on uh, having this webinar take place is because I heard an interview of the mayor of Ithaca, New York, and he has instituted um, fairly far reaching green stormwater infrastructure projects in his city. And uh, he does that, especially with the business community by incentivizing them. And I'm going to put in the chat the link to that podcast. And I, I would encourage everyone to take a moment and listen to it. It's part of a broader podcast, uh, but the part where the mayor of Ithaca, New York explains how he did it and why he did it is really um, sort of eye-opening. And it's also rather inspiring uh, to realize that it can be done. So again, I encourage you to uh, take a moment and, and listen to this podcast about climate change and cities and how we can adapt um, uh, to a very quickly changing world. The other thing I'd like to mention is that in terms of vegetation for 
green stormwater infrastructure projects, Ruth Pike Watershed Initiative would always encourage you to use native plants. They have the kind of root systems uh, that really work in concert uh, with a lot of other factors within the environment to uh, improve stormwater infiltration. And you have a lot of resources in the community, certainly Root Pike Wind is one, but also Wild Ones. Most people have local chapters of Wild Ones. Uh, our national uh, office is here in Wisconsin in the Fox River Valley. Uh, and uh, any chapter of the Prairie Enthusiasts uh, are also very good resources. So there are a lot of people out there that you can turn to for assistance. All right, thank you, Julia. That was wonderful. I really appreciate it. All right, uh, Bree, I'm going to make you the host now. Uh, and if you'd like to start sharing your screen, that would be wonderful. Looks like I'm not the host quite yet. Oh, it might take a moment. I should be. On my screen, it says Casey Griffiths is the host. Casey Griffiths. Oh, it's probably, no, I'm not seeing that. Um, let me reclaim and then we'll try it again, shall we? Sure. All right. I now have hosting abilities. <laughs> okay. So let's do that that. Can you all see my screen? Yes. All right. Oh. Yeah. There we go. So Julia, you did a wonderful job introducing this topic. <laughs> Um, I'm so pleased. Um, I was going to touch on some of those things, but you did such a great job. Um, talking about codes and ordinances and setting it up. It is so incredibly important um, that codes and ordinances are reviewed and looked at so that we can do some of the things that I'm gonna talk about. So when we are, are you seeing the actual presentation? Just checking. Uh, no, no. If you, we can see your screen, um, but if you can hit. So the share and then choose a different screen. There, now can you see it? Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, I'm Bree Plier. I'm the manager of sustainability for the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District. I've been with the district for about 12 years. Um, worked my way up from an internship position um, into really helping to craft and manage a lot of the district's green stormwater infrastructure projects. And I always think it's a little important to give some context. Um, so who is the MMSD? The MMSD is a regional uh, government agency and we serve 1.1 million customers in 28 different municipalities. And essentially what we are tasked with doing is uh, wastewater reclamation and treatment, uh, regional flood management, um, and green infrastructure as a function of both of those and a whole host of other things. We partner with a lot of other um, government agencies and nonprofit or NGOs um, to look at water quality, um, research, things like that. So we really try to be very involved in what's happening, um, particularly with our waterways. So where did we come from? Um, we have a legacy in our region, um, particularly within the city of Milwaukee of industry. Uh, we had used our rivers essentially as open sewers um, and the environment was really kind of an afterthought. I think planning was also kind of an afterthought <laughs> if you think about um, some of the, the early developments we had in our cities. Um, and so it's, what, our, what we are sort of tasked with doing right now is looking at how do we sort of fix some of the problems that we generated in the past. Initially, when we were looking to sort of make progress on that, um, you know, we started with simple things like the Milwaukee River flushing tunnel, and that came about in the late 1800s. And essentially what that 
the whole purpose was was to flush all of the waste out of the Milwaukee River. So we would pump up Lake Michigan water and flush the river. Um, I had once gotten in an argument with one of my environmental studies professors who had said, you know, dilution is the solution to pollution. I was really mad because I didn't agree with that answer on a test. And so I argued with her about that. And I still don't believe that today. Um, and so, you know, this, this legacy of the flushing tunnel is definitely one of those where we, you know, we're trying to clear out the rivers um, by essentially just moving that waste onto Lake Michigan. We now know that that is not the right way to process um, our, our waste. So, you know, Early on in our times in the city of Milwaukee and some parts of Shorewood, uh, we have what are called combined sewers. So that is where you have sanitary water from inside of a home, building, whatever, and storm water all going in the same pipe. And if you can look at these photos, it's very clear that, you know, these essentially the combined sewers at this point in time were just acting as conveyance just right out into our waterways for our sewage and our industrial waste. And then we sort of moved on in the 1920s as there was more of a shift into um, promoting public health. Um, and then, you know, the city of Milwaukee sort of history with the sewer socials. And I always like to talk a little bit about John Goethe. And if you have, ha have not had a chance to read some of his books about the making of Milwaukee, there's a particular chapter in there about sewer socialism that is extremely fascinating. Um, and it really sort of highlights um, essentially what you're seeing in these pictures is how, how can we help protect our environmental resources and sort of move forward. And, you know, the, the 1920s sort of blew the top off with that, and we ended up building our Jones Island wastewater treatment plant in the city of Milwaukee. And then throughout the decades, we did a lot more. We added another treatment plant. There were more sewers put in. There was a little more concern and consideration given to area waterways that were leading to essentially our drinking water source. So fast forward then into the 1970s, the Clean Water Act really changed everything about the way that we sort of operate. Um, it was such an impactful uh, piece of legislation that went through and, and essentially led to us getting sued by the state of Illinois in 1973. I'm not going to say that was a bad thing because it resulted in the water pollution abatement program. And that particular program then helped to push our organization to a point now where we were able to get the deep tunnel designed and constructed, expanding both of our wastewater treatment plants, upgrades into the sewer system. It was a really heavy lift. And we were able to do this at a time where there was federal funding available to invest in some of these upgrades. And so um, other communities now that are facing similar sort of consent decrees or um, other legislation of the like are having a, a much harder time, I think, right now trying to figure out how they are going to fund and finance um, all of these projects and get them done on their uh, associated timelines. So I, you know, the deep tunnel is a very important part of our system, um, but it can't be the end all be all. I think uh, part of Julia's uh, discussion kind of said there was not one code to rule them all. Well, there is not one engineered solution to rule them all here um, in terms of storm water. And so the deep tunnel is 300 feet below ground. It can hold up to 521 million gallons um, of, of sewage, and it's fairly large in diameter. And essentially, it, it does what it was designed to do, which was to minimize basement backups and overflows. So what the deep tunnel does is it will hold wastewater during times of rain so that we can try to um, preserve the capacity at our plants. And it, it really has worked well for us in the long run. So it, it officially went online in 1994. And prior to the deep tunnel coming online, we would have overflows about 50 to 60 times per year. So that's equivalent to almost every time that it rains. 
you know, post the deep tunnel coming online, we're at an average about two to three overflows per year. And we have about a 98 and a half percent capture and treat rate on average. Um, if you go back and look at the Clean Water Act, there's an 85% capture and treat rate. So for communities that are under consent decrees or things of that nature right now, they are not meeting that 85%. So I, I like to make that distinction that uh, we are meeting those requirements, um, but there is still so much more to do. We don't have to stop now. And one of the reasons that we won't stop now is that Climate change is happening. Um, it is something that is going to greatly affect how our system functions and the amount of water that we get. It's going to affect water quality with these uh, reoccurring huge storms, you know, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2015, 2018. It's really important to us that we are doing everything that we can to adapt um, to the changing climate and also mitigate uh, what is happening. So we are seeing that with this wetter weather, weather, it is increasing the amount of rain and therefore the flow that we are getting. Um, but it also has these other adverse impacts such as rising temperatures, reduced biodiversity, you know, it's killing off more of our tree species and it's creating lower air quality. And we also realize that some of the things that we're doing with green stormwater infrastructure can also help to address some of these other issues that are being seen with climate change or are expected to come with climate change. So there's a couple different things that we have been doing. We've been looking at strategies, like I said, to mitigate or adapt. So internally at the district, we wanna reduce our emissions. We wanna create carbon sinks you know, with trees and green infrastructure. We will also wanna definitely make sure we are trying to control that stormwater that's entering into our sewer system and increase our wastewater treatment capacity. Um, we've done some climate vulnerability analyses that sort of looked at where pinch points in our system gonna be, looking at some of those risks and then making recommendations for future actions. And as a follow-up to that 2014 analysis, we adopted a regional resiliency plan. This is not something that MMSD alone is gonna be able to tackle, but it's really gonna require a regional approach um, of government agencies, individual residents, businesses, um, NGOs, et cetera. Um, and we wanna identify cooperative actions. Where are there places where we can sort of overlap with other people and organizations to help get this work done? And really get us to that next level, which is resilience. Um, part, of, part of our serious um, care about what's going on with climate change is that we have made significant investments in uh, infrastructure over the last 50 years. And we wanna make sure that all of that money and time and all those resources that have went into those investments, um, like our county grounds or the um, basins that we are putting up in the 30th Street corridor and things like that, that those investments are going to be protected. Uh, we also want to continue to work towards improving water quality. A lot of the things that we do to help manage uh, regional flooding or storm, regional stormwater things can also improve water quality. Um, and we also recognize that they can help to reduce the urban heat island. If there's areas where we can depave and get rid of some of those extra parking spaces and things like that, we definitely want to take a look at how we can do that and how we can make those areas better for stormwater while also bringing in some of those other community benefits. Um, particularly important in urban areas is also looking at how we can use green infrastructure to help um, our, our protect our forests and also help to um, protect species, critical species from being, um, you know, sort of run out of their ability to um, have active um, habitat areas. And then we also wanna look at how we can work with other partners to layer in other community and pro project benefits for community needs. And so some of the ways that we've done that is to sort of look at how we operate and change those operations. 
We want to make sustainability a core value and an operational philosophy at MMSD. And so one of the ways we did that was we adopted a sustainability um, measure that says we are going to look at the economic, the social, and the environmental impacts of all of our projects and our operations throughout our district uh, for what we do. We also looked at developing programs that have supported wetland and open space preservation. And I'll talk a little bit more about our green seams um, projects later. And then also using green infrastructure to keep that water out of the sewers. So we have what's called the 2035 vision and that 2035 vision is looking to do a couple things. Uh, one is integrated watershed management, which really speaks to that wetland and open space preservation. The things in the upper reaches of the watershed um, should be coordinated and should be taken into account with what's happening in the lower reaches of the watershed. Water does not care about political boundaries. Um, and so it's really important that we are communicating and working with others in the headwaters of the different um, watersheds that we are in. And then also using green infrastructure, keeping that water out of the sewers, that's going to help us to achieve our 2035 vision goal of getting to zero overflows by the year 2035. And um, then we also want to move forward and continue to work on improving the conditions of our regional and our and local sewers with our the municipalities that we serve. Um, and then again, looking at project alternatives that could offer multiple benefits. So it may have a higher upfront cost now, but recognizing that that higher upfront cost now may give a, a better benefit um, or a more wide reaching effect later on, that that is something to take into account. It doesn't always have to be the cheapest option right now. So what is green infrastructure? At MMSD, we consider green infrastructure um, the practice of managing water where it is falling. Um, typically, green infrastructure practices are used to mimic natural hydrologic functions um, and infiltrate, store, and evapotranspire stormwater, and also filtering pollutants from that stormwater. So I think it's great that Julia brought up Bradford Beach. Here's another picture of what has happened at Bradford Beach. This is the parking lot right across from the um, iconic uh, beach building. And this is a bioswale that was put in to capture that runoff from that parking lot. Um, different types of green infrastructure that MMSD funds and encourages are things like cisterns and rain barrels, particularly the smaller scale things like rain barrels or rain gardens on individual residential private property, um, larger measures like bioswales, bioretention, um, stormwater trees, constructed wetlands if there is the area to do it. And when I say constructed wetlands, I also mean enhanced wetlands too. Um, you may have projects where um, over time, some wetlands have been filled in, but there's still some remnant pieces around and going back in and sort of trying to restore that hydrologic function by either adding capacity back in or adding additional space where those wetlands can fully exist. Um, and then in situations where you've got really urbanized areas, green roofs, um, permeable pavement, um, natural landscaping. So to uh, Nan's point about um, native landscaping and native plants, I think that sort of speaks to, we need to work towards changing the aesthetic vision of folks to understand that like native plants can be beautiful too. There are ways that you can give a more ornamental or quote unquote organized appearance by using natural landscaping. It just requires that to sort of be the thought. What's in this bioswale is a little more wild and woolly. I think it kind of works for this scenario because you're at a beach, you're in nature, um, but maybe in a more um, sort of, you know, urban, urban setting, you might want to have something that's a little more uh, ornamental looking or planned looking. And then finally, soil amendments. So much of the soil in southeastern Wisconsin is really heavy clay soils and soil amendments can be a way for us to introduce organic matter into those soils and to help to sort of break that layer up and allow it to act more as a stormwater sponge when it's raining. So the district over the last 12 years that I've been here has sort of, um, well, I should say for the last 15 years, we've really been dabbling in green infrastructure and sort of started with some of those pilot programs. 
um, and pilot projects, and then moved into more formalized um, funding or assistance programs. So what we have the Green Infrastructure Partnership Program, and that is for um, either public or private property owners that are looking to get some incentive funding to put in green infrastructure. This program was really started to get folks to think about using green infrastructure over like a traditional stormwater pond so that we could get those additional benefits. Um, and that the green infrastructure partnership program gives up to 50% of the construction funding for green infrastructure um, for particular projects that are um, competitively selected through our application program. And that those applications, if you're within our service area, uh, open typically in January and close in early March. Then there's the green solutions funding. That was a separate pot of funding where we had some municipal staff reach out to us and say, you know, we want to do more green infrastructure, but it's really hard to make the case for doing specifically green infrastructure when there's so many other competing interests within our budget. And we said, okay, well, we can figure out a program that we can take in some of that funding for your community and we can give that back to you. And that money has to be specifically used on green infrastructure projects. And then we started uh, in 2020, the Fresh Coast Protection Partnership. So this is kind of moving to the next level of implementation where we're looking to ramp up gallons so that we can reach the 2035 vision of zero overflows by 2035. Um, so we're looking at big gallons implementation. This is a public private partnership um, where we have teamed up with Corvius Infrastructure Solutions. They've done this elsewhere in the US and they help us work to target green infrastructure in specific areas. Um, that are of benefit to MMSD system. Um, and then they also work with design firms to design the projects. They work with the project site owners to get all the agreements and real estate transactions. And then those projects get turned over into construction and they get built. Um, and then in the end, what the district gets out of those is a conservation easement saying this piece of green infrastructure has been built with this funding and it is going to remain here for a minimum of the next 11 years and it will remain functioning. And this is all to help us not only achieve the 2035 vision, but also um, our Wisconsin pollution, pollutant elimination discharge systems permit uh, requirements. And then we also started the Fresh Coast Resource Center that opened in 2017. We had sort of had some informalized ways of getting information out, um, but really wanted to provide opportunities for people directly, either through workshops where individual residents could learn about what they can do on their homes, um, offer our plant sale, our rain guard or our rain barrel um, program, and then also act as sort of a area where you could get some design assistance. So if you're thinking about planting native landscaping or a rain garden, we've got some tools and some planting plans and things like that that might help you do that. If you don't know how to select plants, you can attend one of our workshops where we bring in master gardeners and other professional plant professional people um, to talk about the different types of plants and planting plants and things of that nature. And then within the last two years, we started what's called the Fresh Coast Ambassadors um, this has been a really great opportunity for us. This is us trying to build the next generation of green infrastructure, environmental science, and conservation folks. So this takes youth from the ages of 14 to 24 and gives them experience working on different projects with MMSD or with Milwaukee County Parks to sort of talk about what are the career options for you. All the while, they also do service learning projects with us where they are going out and maintaining green infrastructure or doing neighborhood cleanups um, or helping on our green seams properties. And then finally, our green summers. This is what's on the picture here. Uh, we work with individual residents in different target neighborhoods each summer, and we sort of try to blanket that neighborhood with um, small scale green infrastructure like rain barrels, rain gardens, or in incorporating native landscaping into um, residence yards. And this has been a program that has really taken off over the last few years, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later. 
but essentially all of the green infrastructure programs that we have, what they are really meant to do is to help us reduce our overflows um, in number and by volume, um, build climate resilience in our region, address environmental justice and equity. Um, you know, there was a time at the district where, um, you know, our projects may not have always had the amount of input from community members as they do now. And we understand that that is something that we need to engage more in. And we are really looking to help put projects and investments in areas where um, there are environmental justice and equity concerns um, to help address those concerns. We're also looking again at a watershed perspective for watershed protection. What happens in the upper reaches of the watershed affects the lower reaches of the watershed and vice versa. So we need to be constantly coordinating and working with others outside of our area to support that watershed approach. Um, and then again, like I had mentioned, supporting habitat and biodiversity just by introducing some of these native plants. Um, we have to try and get people to think in terms not on just mowed turf grass. That is a monoculture that is not supportive of habitat and biodiversity. And so just by incorporating some of these other types of plants um, into our landscaping that can really help to support that and immensely help with stormwater um, volume capture. So to talk about a couple of really special projects, I always put the Paps Brewery as number one on my list. It is my most favorite green infrastructure project of all time. I think it is the most beautiful urbanized green infrastructure project I have ever seen. Uh, the bioswales at the Paps are incredible. Um, this, this site, I feel like really did it right in terms of stormwater. The Paps Brewery used to be about 95% impervious and all of that water was going into the combined sewer system. What we have now is a situation where it's capturing that water and holding it and then slowly releasing it to the combined sewer system. So that's a little bit different than infiltrating that water. We can't necessarily infiltrate at the PAP site because of prior industrial uses um, or other utility concerns, but there is the ability to still capture and hold that water and slowly release it to help us in the times where we are getting inundated with excessive amounts of rain. Um, so around the PAPS, you'll see all kinds of things like they've got bioswales, there's green roofs, there's stormwater trees, they have um, detached the roof drain systems and put them into uh, underground um, cistern type systems like this park um, here, this Zilber Park, the underneath side, the under part of that is collecting the water off of the two adjacent roofs, which I think is really awesome. Um, and then they also did permeable pavement in the parking stalls there. So as that water is sort of traveling down that street on a hill, that water has the chance then to get infiltrated and put into um, like an underground cistern system to be slowly released back to the combined sewer system. Another project that was most recently um, completed is the Chiswick at Dunwood by the Mandel Group. Um, the Mandel Group has come in on a lot of projects with us. We really like working with them. They get their projects done on time. Um, and typically when they come to us with an idea, they're ready to go, which is great. And I think this project looks absolutely gorgeous. They have incorporated native landscaping. They've got lots of pollinator habitat. Um, there's walking paths so that the folks that live in this um, building have this amenity that they can go out and see and share. Um, there's rain gardens, there's stormwater trees, they've got a small green roof. I mean, this is the kind of thing we sort of hope for from development is that they're sort of thinking about um, obviously stormwater management, but this has a benefit for the developer um, community as well. Just imagine the um, being able to list these kinds of amenities for something that you're looking to rent out. That is offers a great benefit, I think, to developers. Um, and that, I think, has been part of Mandel's strategy um, with some of their recent developments. So I just wanted to highlight this as a, a beautiful project. Um, this is one of my other favorite projects. This is the Grinker restoration site. Um, aside from Mike and Sharon Grinker being the salt of the earth kind of people and just wonderful to work with, they took this site near Fifth and Cherry in um, the city of Milwaukee 
and they turned it into this beautifully landscaped, but also highly functional space. They made their interior parking lot area permeable pavers, which I think looks really, really great. Um, and then they also did around their borders, they added more trees in, and they also added in some native landscaping, which has been a really, really great benefit um, for the community and the surrounding neighborhood looks better for it. And they have rentable space for um, like breweries or restaurants and other parts of their building that they're not using. And they've been able to rent them out consistently and very quickly because these amenities are there and around the area. This was a great project that we worked on uh, with Cudahy at their city hall. Um, so you, you know, if you wanna do permeable pavement, you don't necessarily have to do what the Grinkers did uh, with theirs, which is kind of the whole area, but you can do selective permeable pavement where you can sort of direct that water right into that middle strip. Um, and that's more common of what we're seeing with like green alleys and things like that. So that you still have a solid area for like a garbage truck with, um, you know, heavy tires and heavy truck traffic kind of coming through. Really, really great design on that. Um, also saves a little bit of money, uh, but the underground storage basin is much larger than what you see on the surface. Um, they also have these bioswales. So these are kind of similar to what's at the PAPS, a little bit different. Um, some other community safety concerns, you know, they have these, um, this fencing around theirs that also kind of helps keep some of the larger trash and debris out of there. However, when people complain that there's trash and debris in green infrastructure and say, oh my God, it's just, it's all just full of garbage. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It is collecting that stuff. Otherwise that's going to go down the storm drain or blow off somewhere else. At least if it ends up in the green infrastructure, you have sort of a centralized location where you can pick that out. So I don't necessarily see that as, as a crazy complaint. Um, this other project we recently finished in the last two years was the Sherman Phoenix. This is near the Fondy Market. Um, this is a really neat space. There's um, a lot of small little restaurants in there and little like maker spaces and markets. So this brings a lot of community people in. They did a permeable pavement um, sort of patio outside. They did a lot of native landscaping and added some stormwater trees. This is an area where there is not a ton of open green space or greenery around. So this was a way that they could really sort of dress up and make this space even more inviting from the outside to get people inside, um, all while making sure to manage that stormwater where it's falling on their property. And then this is a, a little bit about our green summer. So our neighborhood outreach I talked about. These projects, I can't just, I cannot overstate the benefits of these projects. This is really something that has helped to provide what I call a human face on a government entity. Um, we send crews of young people out to go and work with residents directly one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and they are doing, you know, the installs, they're helping the residents get this work done. And it really, in turn, you know, it doesn't get us necessarily a ton of gallons towards our, our 2035 vision, but what it does is it builds public goodwill, public understanding, and then people are more supportive of our other projects that are going on. So we typically try to tie our neighborhood outreach programs with other larger projects at the district or other green infrastructure projects that are around or upcoming so that we can build neighborhood understanding and support for those um, projects. I had sort of mentioned the, the you know, issue of the upper reaches of the watershed and the lower reaches. I would be remiss if I did not talk about our green seams program. It's not technically what we consider in our list of green infrastructure proper, but it is green infrastructure. Essentially, this is saying this piece of land is great and we should not develop it because it has these very key attributes to it, like hydric soils that are very needed, or it is a long uh, adjacent to a waterway, so in a riparian area. Um, this is going to be an area of key development need in the future. How can we help to sort of drive development into areas that aren't going to create 
uh, flooding issues in the lower reaches of the watershed or at this por portion of the watershed. So um, hopefully by the end of this year, we'll be at about 5,000 acres that have been permanently protected from um, development. And we are consistently working with the conservation fund to either uh, restore or replant trees on these properties or restore the native prairies that may have been there or wetlands that may have been there at some point in the past. Um, so kind of touching on a little bit of the things that uh, Julia had talked about, regulatory changes. That's a huge, huge thing. Um, we updated our chapter 13 in um, 2019, and that was something where you know, we were seeing a lot of smaller developments creating less than, um, you know, less than a half acre of imperviousness come in. Every developer was going to come in just under that half acre, and it was like a death by a thousand cuts. And we weren't necessarily making progress on, on that in a stormwater sense. So what we wanted to do was sort of tweak our Chapter 13 rules to encourage the use of green infrastructure for smaller impervious sites. Um, and also help folks be able to figure out how they can do that. Um, I wanna give a big shout out to the city of Milwaukee. They updated their landscaping um, design standards and it really is a great document. Um, and as Julia had said, you know, the updating those codes and ordinances and those landscaping standards is so key in order for any of these projects and programs to happen. Um, and we are continuing to work uh, with folks like Wisconsin Sea Grant um, Clean Wisconsin, Julie Beth Hines at Birchline Planning, um, and others that are in this arena sort of looking at how we can complete this update to those codes and ordinances. Um, and then again, our, our programs that we have for green infrastructure are ways that we can help to promote that resilience by getting projects in the ground. Um, and we are actively collaborating and coordinating with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources um, to review and look at their stormwater management standards, um, provide them with data about projects we've had that have been done well or ones that maybe didn't work so well so that they can work towards um, continuously improving those standards as we go by. So what we're kind of looking at with a lot of our green infrastructure um, nowadays is we are looking at trying to target green infrastructure in very specific areas. Um, first, I want to note areas of urban heat islands. Um, so we're working with a map that's from the Trust for Public Land, and we're trying to look at areas where there may be urban heat island, um, but also CDC social vulnerability index, um, sort of like tracks. And if you were to try and overlay both of these maps together, you would see that they would almost coincide together um, with um, their, you know, areas of most need. So um, I think that's a really interesting thing um, that we've been trying to look at and sort of catalog with our projects as we try to find places to implement. We're also looking at TMDL, so the total maximum daily loads um, and baseline pollutant loadings. Um, so what we did was we worked with some internal folks that um, were involved in the TMDL process and had them sort of rank some of these sub basins for ones that had the highest pollutant loadings. Um, and those are also gonna be areas where we are gonna wanna target implementation. And then finally, one other thing I wanna note is um, with the combined sewer area being such an important and key part of what we do, there, there is a benefit to the combined area. In, in times where we're not having an overflow, it's really great because all of that dirty stormwater is able to get treated at our wastewater treatment plants. However, there are times when that system does get overloaded and we do have those overflows. So I wouldn't be on the side of folks to say, oh, we need to spend the money and do away with the combined sewer. It actually does provide a lot of benefit um, if, if you kind of dig deeper into that subject. But there are some areas where we have really, really high inflow into the deep tunnel. And so you, know, you can see some of these areas, the purples and the reds here are areas where there is extremely high inflow into the deep tunnel uh, when it rains. And so those are also areas where we are going to want to prioritize green infrastructure investment to help keep that water out of the sewer system. Um, and then uh, sort of a, a final thought, I 
kind of want to leave you guys with is um, looking at you as at utilities as anchor institutions. This was there was an article that recently came out um, talking about this. Um, I think it was from WEF, and and it's I think it's really important to sort of think about how as a utility we have the ability to impact the equity the social and the economic fabric of our communities and the region um, and some of the responsibilities that come along with that. So I think that's one of the reasons why MMSD is so keen on looking towards partnering with groups either like the Root Pike Win um, or other nonprofits and things like that to try and get um, these green infrastructure projects and these other sort of resilience projects in the ground because we realize that the benefits of these types of projects go so far beyond just the stormwater value of them but they really are things that affect people's lives they affect the rest of the environment um, and they're they have the ability to make our communities better and stronger in the face of climate change and so I would like to thank you guys so much for your time. If you want to check out some of the free resources that are available to um, either residents um, or other NGOs or government agencies, feel free to jump onto freshcoastguardians.com. That's where we've got our planting plans. There's information on our events. We've recently gotten connected with Root Pike Wind, so we're going to get their events put out on our events page and through our social media. So um, we are... I'm really excited that uh, we were asked to be here today. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was really uplifting and inspiring. I appreciate you sharing uh, all of that with us. Uh, I'm going to put another resource in the chat. Um, this is a case study that is really interesting and gives a lot of uh, very good statistics in terms of how much stormwater runoff can be treated, mitigated, addressed through green infrastructure pro uh, projects. Uh, and again, I would encourage all of the participants to uh, download and uh, take a peek at it. Um, so uh, at this point in time, I would like to open it up to questions, comments, requests uh, from all of our participants. Um, you can simply unmute yourself and ask questions or if you're shy, you can put it in the chat box. Either one is acceptable. Uh, again, thanks to both of our experts today, Julia and Bree. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. It was just wonderful. All right, so we're ready for questions, comments. I, I, I'll, I have a question. Uh, could you share with us, Bree, the kind of tree species you like to use for stormwater trees? the type of tree species. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't necessarily have any sort of specific tree that I would push forward. A couple things I will say about stormwater trees that we have learned and are still learning, we're still sort of learning in, in this space, especially with trees, is that you need to find trees that either fit the community's needs. So ones that are gonna be dropping a ton of like fruits and things like that are typically ones that people don't wanna see on like streets or sidewalks because it can, can kind of get messy and things like that. Um, but also I would say work with your local city forester, the types of the people that understand tree communities and um, how you need to sort of have a mix of trees to meet what's happening with climate change. You know, we kind of don't want to have just this one species, kind of like how we sort of ended up with ash trees, where now it's like so much of our, our forests are dead because of the emerald ash borer. So sort of looking to um, mixing it up in terms of those tree species. Um, I did have a forester recently that I talked to said that they were really interested in ginkgo trees because they tend to be more uh, resilient to pests and things like that. Um, I've seen a lot of sad street trees, kind of like what Julia had shown in her presentation where it's just like, oh man, maybe that wasn't the best option for that type of green infrastructure or the best place to put a tree. So definitely thinking about like the life of a street tree is a hard life. So being prepared to have to replace them fairly often, I think is something that has to be considered. I did see in the pictures uh, that birch tree trees were well represented, white birches. Uh, and generally people tend to like those a great deal. Yeah, 
it, that may have just been an aesthetic preference for yeah. <laughs> both sides. <laughs> right. Anyone else? Questions? Comments? All right, then. I think we will uh, consider this uh, exceptionally well done, thanks to our experts. Uh, again, uh, we appreciate everyone uh, who signed up for this webinar uh, and for taking the time out of your day to hopefully learn um, and expand your horizons. Uh, and so with that, we will say have a good rest of the afternoon uh, and we will see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.